service to begin, we welcome you to the uh, Young Preachers Tent Meeting. Amen. How many have never been in a tent revival service? Did anybody confess that? Amen. Brother Cassidy, are you kidding me? Wow. Well, there's a few that haven't, but we're thankful for your coming. And uh, Brother Ted's coming as a moderator tonight, but he asked me to say a word, and we uh, just uh, had a vision to... I wanted to tell the Lord in some way, thank you for the chances I got as a young preacher. And I didn't know what to do, and this kind of put on my heart just to tell, tell the Lord, thank you for the privilege. I remember Brother Ted called me, and I thought, you think maybe he thought I was daddy. And, I, and maybe that he didn't know daddy had passed away. But surely I hung up the phone and said to my wife, he's mistaken. And I appreciate getting a chance to preach and and we want to encourage these young men. Well, let's see who we got tonight that's going to preach this week. Uh, I, some of them I don't know. I know Aaron here, and uh, who else we got? AJ. And uh, so we're, we'll have uh, ten preachers, uh, five, not, not, not at one night. <laughs> amen. Uh, two a night. Ben, God bless you. And uh, so, amen. Uh, and one back there hit. Come on up, brother. Push him up here, Johnny. He can sit with Mama at home. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And secondly, uh, uh, we wanted to, uh, of course, encourage the young preachers. And we'll be passing on someday, and there'll be a lot of work left behind. Amen. My dad left me about 20 years of work, and I'm going to give my son about 30 uh, when I pass on. And, and just pass on. Somebody's got to take the mantle and keep going. Yep. Just takes one link in the chain to break, and you've lost the chain. And we need preaching now worse than we've ever needed it. Desperate. So I pray that you'll be encouraged, and I also want you to look around. We're not in a church building. I hope you see tonight that you can preach on the street. You can preach in tents. You can preach on the radio. Uh, you can preach on the, uh, the uh, in the nursing homes, and I hope you'll get by this. I didn't want to have this in a church because to give you an idea how you could get out where the centers are and help people yeah. Yeah. Uh, that would come, maybe wouldn't come to a church. So I'm going to ask Brother Ted to come. He's got the announcement about the, the water and the restrooms and you come Brother Ted and we look forward to having you every night. Amen. We'll fill it up a fr Friday night. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Appreciate the burden on Brother Roy's heart to have this meeting. And that's where it originated uh, in his heart as the Holy Ghost led him. And uh, if he's led by the Holy Ghost, we're going to follow his leadership. Good to be here tonight. Thank God for every church that's represented. And we thank God, especially on this day of horror that I just heard about a few minutes ago there in Washington and those that were killed. Aren't you glad we're still free to have this service tonight? And it is being challenged by a false religion in our land. And let's just pray that America might remain the free country that it is tonight and that we might enjoy the blessing to be in here. And as far as restrooms are concerned, if you're in good shape, you can get to it. It's down the hill there in that shed. And so uh, if you need to go to the restroom, it's way down there uh, to the left. And so you feel free to go down there. Also, we have water over here, water over here, and water in the back. And we ask you, though, uh, to go down the side. If you need some water, go down the side so you won't disturb the singing or the preaching. And respect the songs and respect the scripture. And uh, we'll all get along. And again, now, Brother Jimmy was going to moderate, Brother Jimmy Lewis, but because of a death of Rufus uh, Whaley, why well, he won't be able to be here. And uh, his deacon, Brother Glenn, is going to be moderating in the service tomorrow night. And I told Brother Jimmy now, moderate and not preach. Uh, there's, a, there's a pastor here that preached on credit for several years and finally announced his call. But Brother Glenn will be moderating. He may get a little bit excited, but he is supposed to moderate for Brother Jimmy. Amen. So you remember that. and Remember the preachers each night. And we're going to have a great time in the Lord. And what we're going to do, we're going to have an altar of prayer. Uh, before we have any singing, and then after the altar prayer, Eddie Watson is going to lead us in a congregational song, and then we're going to have a special song, and then we'll be back to introduce uh, the preacher for tonight. 
But everybody that's physically able, let's gather here in the altar, and I'm going to ask Brother Donnie Dalton to lead us to the throne of grace. Father, we're grateful to you. everybody stand if you will let's sing victory in Jesus I'm glad we have the victory through him amen, amen.
Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We've got a lot to be thankful for, don't we? The Lord has blessed us in a mighty way. I tell you what, this beautiful day that the Lord has given us, uh, a good family, a good home, a good church, the opportunity to meet in a field under a tent and worship the Lord freely. Now that's something to be thankful for right there. Amen. And I'm still glad we've got that right. And I'm thankful for that. We can't thank him enough. Thank you, Lord. Join us on the chorus on this song. Amen. For making the sun to shine, putting the stars in the sky for the flowers that bloom, the ocean so blue. Thank you, Lord. Let me tell you who all is up here. Sister Lola Cassidy, everybody knows Charles and Lola. They've been, uh, they're just living legends around here, and we appreciate them and their faithfulness to the Lord. God bless his faithfulness, and we appreciate Charles and Lola. Let's give them a hand. Amen. Amen. Brother Jonathan, Eddie Watson, Chris King, 
and Ken over here, they are instrumentalists at the church, and they do a real good job. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Aren't you glad for good spiritual singing? Yes. Almost 300 times in the King James Version of the Bible, it talks about singing or singers or musical instruments of God. And thank God for that. It uh, gets us ready for the Word of God. Amen. We appreciate the good spiritual singing. I don't want to kill the service, but we need to take up an offering. The uh, rent uh, for this tent is over $1,000. In fact, a little over $1,200. And I believe that God will use through His people to meet the expense of that this week. And uh, we've got somebody that's already had to foot that bill in advance. And we don't want them to be under a heavy burden. We want to share that financial burden with them. And so uh, I don't want to kill the service before Brother Jackson preaches, but we need to take care of some business. Amen. Uh, Brother Martin Cook says we got some very important business to take care of. Amen. And so we're going to do that tonight. And uh, Brother Glenn, could you and uh, Chris come tonight and take up the offering? We have some not Baptist uh, uh, dishes, but we have what is called faith buckets here tonight, amen, amen. to receive this off. Brother Glenn, please come and ask the blessing on the offering, and let's stand here, please. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this another privilege that you've given us, Lord, together once again to worship. God, we thank you, Lord, that on the outside, God, we can feel the presence of God. God, we thank you for these that have had it in their heart to have this meeting this week. God, I pray for each of these young preachers, God, as they stand each night. I pray that the anointing hand of God would be upon each one of them. God bless each church, each pastor, Lord, that has put forth the efforts for these meetings. God, we pray now that you'll bless this offering. Take care of the finances. We know you will. In Jesus' name, we'll give you thanks. Amen. that open door ought to uh, put a check for a fifth of what's ever left over so that the expenses of this tent meeting are met. My treasure's here tonight, and we'll have to butt heads, I guess, after a while about that. But let's, let's give, and let's, I, I really believe the need will be met. Before then, I believe our God is big enough. And we appreciate young preachers, and both of the young preachers that I've invited tonight have been in our local assembly and preached the Word of God. And one thing about both of these young men, they preach with compassion. And you don't see that in a lot of preachers, especially when they get older. And in some of the younger preachers, it seems like they have a bless God type of attitude and are not broken about it. But the Bible says uh, with compassion we can make a difference. And I appreciate Brother Jackson Smith. We're going to pray for him that God just might bless him and help him. Brother, you come ahead. Young preacher from down at the Hilltop Baptist Church. 
You pray as he comes tonight and preaches the gospel. Amen. There we go. Just a couple things I want to say before we open up our Bibles. If, in case you don't know me, I know most of you in here, but if you don't know me, my name is Brother Jackson Smith, and the Lord has Lord's allowed me to, to preach in quite a bit of churches around here. He's allowed me to have a, and I'm not, I'm not bragging on myself, I'm bragging on the Lord. He's allowed me to have a radio broadcast of about, just about ever since I started preaching. It's 8.30 to 9 o'clock every Saturday morning. On the 800 AM River of Life radio broadcast. Thank you. We've also, one of the greatest things that the Lord's allowed me to do, I've, we've got to preach on the street, got to preach in nursing homes, got to preach in churches. But one of the greatest things God ever allowed me to do, and I just wanted to say this, was He allowed me to preach in a foreign country. Amen. It was the country of Thailand. Not a, lot of, not a lot of people anymore get the opportunity to do that, and I thank God for that. Amen. But whether you're a preacher or not, if you have the opportunity to ever go on a foreign mission trip, you need to take it. It'll change your life. It'll change your life. I've got a couple of people here that I just want to want to make mention of. I've, my mother's back there, and I've got a saved mama. Amen. And if, you, if you've got a saved mama, you've got a good family. I've got some other family here, and I love them. I've also got a father-in-law back there that I, I want to make mention of. He's really helped me in my life, and I love him dearly. But perhaps the, the greatest thing that God's ever given me is my wife. I believe the biggest decision a man can ever make outside of salvation is who he's going to marry. Amen. And I thank God for my wife. She's been good to me. We're going to turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, if you would. I know you've stood a lot, but I believe in reverence in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. We're just going to read two verses that are not real popular in Baptist churches anymore, but that'll be all right. We're just going to preach what God's laid on our heart. That's all I can do. You know, I might make a hundred enemies, but if I, if one person's life gets changed, it's worth it. It's worth it. So that'll be all right. First Corinthians chapter number 6, verse number 19. Paul said, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? We're going to stop reading verse number 20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as I stand before you tonight, God, I'm a man of unclean lips, Lord, just like Isaiah was. Lord Jesus, I'm not anything at all. I don't claim to be anything outside of the blood of Calvary. Father, please, I pray that you would convict tonight. God, we need conviction here. Lord, we don't need no tickling of ears. God, we don't need anything like that. God, we don't need any sweet preaching tonight. Lord, we need Holy Ghost conviction. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd help me. Oh, Father, just to preach what you laid on my heart. Lord, I don't deserve it. I never have deserved it. I don't deserve to be saved. Lord, I deserve to be in hell, but I'm so thankful that you've saved me on December the 16th, 2007. Lord, I thank you for preaching, and I thank you for preachers. And Lord Jesus, I just pray that you'd help us tonight. God, help us to clean up our life. Lord, we need you so bad. We need you so bad. Please help this community. You know, it's been a burden on our heart for so long to be able to preach in a tent. Please, Lord Jesus, I pray that you help these people, help this community through this message. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want to preach for just a little while. I don't have a fancy title or anything like that, but that'll be okay. I just want to preach on the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, as a matter of introduction, throughout time, God has manifested His presence in three different places. In the book of Exodus, He manifested His presence in the tabernacle. Under King Solomon, he manifested his presence in the temple. But today, in the New Testament church, can I tell you something this, this, this evening? The temple of God is not Hilltop Baptist Church. 
Listen, the temple of God is not old-fashioned Baptist church or any of these other Baptist churches that are in here. Listen, the temple of God is your body. It's your body. These Corinthians didn't understand that. They didn't understand that. They had to be reminded of this. And you know what? I'm afraid that a lot of times in these days and in this area, we need to be reminded of that. That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's not a building. It's a body. It's your body. They had to be reminded of this. They had some problems. And we're going to preach a little bit about their problems this evening. And I'm afraid that we might have some of the same problems. And I, listen, we can't we can't sit up here and lie and say we've got a perfect community full of perfect churches. We don't. We've got problems. We've got issues. And we need preaching. We need conviction. They had some issues. Look at verse 19 again. Paul said, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? You know what? The first thing I see, they were uneducated. Amen. They were uneducated. Now, I'm not saying that you got to have a doctorate degree to be right with God. No. Don't, don't try to say, that's not what I'm saying. But they were uneducated right. on. on how they needed to live. Amen. They didn't understand right. that their body was the temple. Right. And I'm afraid that some of us may just not understand that. Right. We just don't understand that. Look at 1 Corinthians 6. I'm not going to have you turn nowhere, but look at verse number 2 up there at the top of the chapter. Look what Paul said. 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Do you not know? Look at verse 3. Know you not. Look at verse 9. Know you not. Look at verse 15. Know you not. Verse 16. Know you not. Verse 19. Know you not. They were uneducated. They didn't know. You know, I don't think that a lot of us, I don't think that we walk around in blatant rebellion to God. I don't think we do that. Hopefully we don't. But I think some of us just aren't educated. We just don't know. So I wonder why these Corinthians didn't know. I wonder why they didn't know. You think it could have been, listen, and I'm not getting on nobody, don't think that, but I wonder if it could have been a lack of preaching. I wonder if it could have been a lack of preaching. I wonder if at that judgment seat of Christ it's going to come here before too long. I wonder if there's going to be some preachers that have to stand up there and they have to answer for carnal church members. And Jesus says, hey, they were carnal. Hey, they didn't live right. They didn't dress right. They didn't. They watched the wrong stuff on television. They listened to the wrong music. But why? No preaching. No preaching. If we'd be honest tonight, we're more interested in a crowd than we are conviction. Listen, I didn't come. I'll be honest with you. Listen, I love every one of you, but I didn't come to make friends. I come for God to change somebody's life. We need, we need God to change somebody's life. These people were uneducated. What? No, you're not. That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, I did a little bit of studying on that city of Corinth. city of Corinth, I'm sure most of you know this. It was a very carnal city. Very carnal city. The city of Corinth is the most carnal church that Paul wrote to. Very carnal city. It was a center of pagan worship. But the false god that they worshipped the most in Corinth, now listen to this, was Aphrodite. Aphrodite. And what they did, and I'm just being honest tonight, this is what they did. They would have a cult of a thousand prostitutes. And that was their religion. That was their religion. That's all they knew. They didn't have any example. Listen, if you study Paul's life, you know he couldn't just stay there. He had to go to other places. He was a missionary. They didn't have an example. Those of us that know 
just a little bit. Those of us that have been preaching or that have been saved for just a little while, and I'm not trying to say I've been saved for 40 years. I'm not 40 years old. But those of us that have been saved for just a little while, don't you think we ought to be examples? Don't you think we ought to be examples? They were uneducated. There was a lack of preaching. All they had around them was Aphrodite worship. Something else that I, that I read that was sad, even after the city of Corinth, there is no such city of Corinth anymore. But even after the city of Corinth was destroyed, did you know for many, many years, people that lived around that area, if somebody, if some lady walked around, and let's just be honest, she was half naked. If some lady walked around without many clothes on, you know what they'd call her? This is what they'd call her, a Corinthian lass. They would look at her, they'd point at her, or they'd point at him. Listen, it's not just ladies we need to preach to. We need preaching to men. I, you know, I think we've got too much preaching towards ladies. We need more preaching on men. We need to learn how to be men. But they would point... And they'd say, that's a Corinthian lass right there. That's a Corinthian lady. They could look at her and see that. I wonder if there ain't people that are... Actually, I know. I don't wonder. I know because I've got, I've got a, somebody that talked to me about it. He, he, he sat down and talked with me about this, why he's not in church. Let me, I, I just feel led to tell you this. This is why a family, a husband, a wife, and two kids are not in church. This is why. When they were in church, their pastor, their pastor's wife, and all their church members, their deacons, when they walked in the building, the church building, remember that's not the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. But when they walked in that building, they had their suits on. Ladies had their dresses on. He saw them same people outside of church. Amen. No, we don't preach like this. There's not much preaching on this anymore. He saw them outside of church in their short shorts on. He saw those same men walking around with their, with their shirts off. We need preaching on that. Walking around half-dressed. Walking around in their little athletic shorts. Their little short shorts, their spaghetti straps, men with their tank tops on. Listen, I, that's, I'm, not preaching, I'm not preaching opinion. That's Bible. That's Bible. But do you know that family's not in church anymore because of how they dressed outside of church? He said, I don't have any respect for that. And you know what? I don't, I don't think it's right for anybody to be outside of church, but you almost can't blame them. Well, we need some help, don't we? Amen. He didn't have an example. I wonder if people could look at us, people that are outside of church, people that used to be right with God, but they aren't. I wonder if they see us in Walmart, they could say, you see that Jackson Smith over there? That's a Corinthian Christian. They see us out, that's a Corinthian Christian. That's a carnal Christian. There was a lack of preaching. Amen. What? No, you're not. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. They had a lack of preaching. They didn't have any example. But you know what I believe that gave them? A loss of perception. A loss of perception. And ye are not your own. We're living in the Laodicean church age. Now, I don't believe we're Laodicean Christians, or we ought not to be. But we're living in those church days. You know what Laodicea means? The actual definition of the word Laodicea, it means the rights of the people. Aren't we living in those days? Sodomites want rights. Women want rights to abort their babies. But hey, we can shout on that, can't we? Amen. Christians want rights. I want to live how I want to live. 
Listen, we'll go out. We'll mark our body up. We'll do all kinds of, just because we want to. It's just how we want to live. It don't matter how God wants us to live. Laodicea. Lost the perception. They didn't understand. They weren't their own. They didn't understand. That they, weren't, that they didn't have rights. In it. Did you know that when you get saved, you're for, you forfeit all your rights? Do you know that you're a bond slave? When you get saved, you forfeit every one of your rights. Lack of preaching and a loss of perception. They were uneducated. They just didn't know. How many of us? We just don't know. Just don't know. But the uneducation gets worse. Look at verse 20, very beginning of the verse. Verse number 20. I'm heading... Trying to head to a stopping point. For you're bought with a price. You're bought with a price. I find it interesting that Paul had to remind them of that. Church of Corinth, the epistle to the first Corinthians, first, second Corinthians, written in the 60s AD. Christ crucified 32, 33 AD. You think about that, that's one generation. That's one generation. They were one generation ahead of Christ. And they already had to be reminded that they had been bought. How much do you think we have to be reminded 2,000 years later that we've been bought? But you know what? This bothers me. They were uneducated. They just didn't know any better, but it gets worse. They were unthankful. They were unthankful. Paul had to remind them. That they'd been bought. Can we be honest tonight? The old story's gotten old. I remember just back in 2007, December the 16th, 2007, many of you know this man, Brother Paul Taylor. He preached at First Bible Baptist Church to me. He took his belt off and started beating on that pulpit, talking about that scourging. And God convicted my heart. Listen, I sat there and I gripped the pulpit. I was under conviction. But you know what? After we've been saved for a little while, we've heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it. And heard it. it just ain't the same anymore. We're just not thankful anymore. They were unthankful. Did you know... Did you know, you, if you don't believe me, you, you can, don't turn there, but you can turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 later on if you don't believe me. You know what a sign of a reprobate is? Unthankfulness. I wonder, I, I wonder if some of us just need to get saved. I wonder if some of us just, Amen. listen, a good friend of mine, his name's Brother Chris Hewitt, he said, he said this, he said, I don't believe we need revival. He said, I believe we need an awakening. We need people that are in the church to get saved. It's a sign of a reprobate to be unthankful. If I was unthankful of what Christ did to me, I'd want to check up. They were unthankful. Paul already had to remind them 30 years later that they had been bought. Notice, for your bought, that's the possession. For ye... Are bought. It's not glad when Jesus left his riches up in heaven and he came down, he became poor. He said, The birds, the birds have nests, the foxes have holes, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. He became poor for you and me. I'm glad he did that. Listen, I'm glad I'm glad he did that not to buy a Corvette. He didn't do that just to buy some just to buy some car, just to buy some nice house. That's what we do. That's not what he did. He did all that to buy us. To buy us. Aren't you glad he didn't just buy the hidden treasure, Israel? He bought the field. He bought the whole world. He bought us Gentiles. We're the possession. He came all the way down from heaven just to buy us. But we'll walk around unthankful. Listen, we'll walk around carnal. Unthankful. Unthankful. We're the possession. There's, there's, 
there's words in the Bible. I know the entire Bible is good. I understand that. But there's certain verses that just stop me every time. Every time I read them, I have to stop and think about it for just a second. And there's just a phrase there. For ye are bought. Notice the next three words. With a price. With a price. Listen, he didn't take a $20 bill to buy you and me. We've got a, I've got an altar. Brother A.J. Smith, he built and gave it to me. It's an old wooden altar. And I pray on that altar. And when I pray on that altar, now I'm just being honest with you, my chest will hit the corner of that wood. And if you pray there for just a little while, it starts to hurt. It does. Pressing your chest up against wood like that, it hurts for a little while. But you know... I was thinking about this today. I, I told my wife, I got up from praying. My chest hurt because of that wood. And I got to thinking about when them Roman soldiers took my Jesus. And they hung him. Listen, they, they had to bend him over like this so they could get so they could really get into the flesh. And his chest was up against that pole, that wood. And they took that scourge. And they beat my Jesus. Listen, the blood dripped from my Jesus. That's the price that he paid. The most precious liquid in the world is not gold. It's blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. He paid the price with blood. Blood. They were unthankful. They were unthankful. Right. See the possession, and we see the purchase, but I'm going to try to be done. Look after that colon there. If you're bought with a price, there's a colon. Therefore, since you've been bought with a price, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Amen. Now, I told you it gets worse and worse. They were uneducated, they didn't know any better. There's, I'm afraid there's a lot of us. We, don't, we just don't know. Whether it's a lack of preaching. I think that might be it. Lack of preaching. We're scared to preach anymore. Listen, if I ever get, I, if I ever get scared to preach, I just, I just want to quit. If I ever get scared to preach what God wants me to preach, I ought not preach. They were uneducated. They didn't know. They were unthankful. He had to remind them. But he said, glorify God Amen. with your body Amen. and your spirit. Amen. It shocks me again that he had to remind them to do that. You know what that makes me think whenever he wrote that? Brother, that makes me think that they must have been glorifying something else. To glorify God. He had to tell them that they were unholy. They were uneducated, which made them unthankful. But when education, when you when you have educa- uneducation and you add unthankfulness, it produced a life of unholiness. Yeah. Of unholiness. We have revival meetings, and let's be honest. What's what's the one thing we think about? Well, I wonder how many people is going to show up. Yeah. You know, when we have revival meetings, and it's okay to think that way. We, we want people to show up. We want, we want people to be added to the church. Listen, that's all right. Sure, we want that. We ought to want that. But I'm going to tell you something. We don't need a revival of people until we get a revival of purity. There's no preaching on purity anymore. There's no preaching on it anymore. There's no preaching... On holiness. You know, that tabernacle, if you read about it, that tabernacle, it had gold. It was overlaid with gold. That was the outside of the tabernacle. Now, I'm all for salvation, repentance, faith. I'm all for those things. All those things are inward. Yeah. But when God chooses 
to place His Spirit somewhere. He makes it look good. It was overlaid with gold. You know what else? You study that tabernacle. It was covered. Oh my. It was covered. And you know what? After they covered it, you know what they did? They covered it again. It had to be covered again. That's on the outside. Listen, I'm all for getting... You have to get something on the inside. And I'm not, I'm not for cleaning them up before you catch them. But after we get caught, we ought to clean up. We ought to clean up. I, I, I don't have any confidence in somebody. If you've seen me before I got saved, you would know there was a difference in my life. If you've seen how I looked, you've seen how I acted, you would know there was a difference in my life. But can I tell you something? I don't have any confidence in somebody that got saved 10, 20 years ago. And they're exactly the same 20 years later. I don't have any confidence in that. I don't have any confidence in it. They were unholy. Paul charges them to glorify God in, number one, in their body. You know what? That's your conduct. Your conduct. The way you dress. It's still important. The way you dress. I'm trying to get done. But you know what? There's times when it just really bubbles up in me that there's something as holy as God that lives in me. You know what that means. You know, we don't like this. But that means that everything you watch on TV, that means... God's watching it too. Everything your eyes look at, Jesus is looking at it. The Holy Ghost is looking at it. Everything you allow to come in your ears, that country, that honky tonk, that rap, that rock, I believe in preaching against that stuff. Yes, sir. Amen. God's listening to it too. God's listening to it. Every time we click on that mouse, I think one of the most underpreached sins of our day, I believe it'd shock us if we knew, is pornography. Do you know over 80% of Baptist ministers said that it was a temptation to look at pornography? Do you know over 60% said it was a struggle. It was a struggle. Every time we click on that mouse, the Holy Ghost is looking. Every time we put on our tank tops and our short shorts and all that and our tight blue jeans, we're making Jesus wear the same thing. He charged them to glorify God in their conduct. That's your body in your body and in your spirit. That's your character. Your character. Now I understand that I preached a lot of outward things, but we can't get right outwardly until we're right inwardly. Character is God-given. It's God-given. We've got to be right in our heart. We gotta be right with God Amen. before we can try to do any of these things. Amen. You know what? That's why that's why drug rehabilitation not usually doesn't work. Do you know that? That's why these self help programs usually don't work because they're not right on the inside. Not right on the inside. That's it. Glorify God in your body and your spirit, your character and your conduct. I'm just I'm done. But I do want to say this in closing. I believe that God's looking for some people in McMinn County that'll say, God, I, I, won't just, I, I don't want you to just save me. 
God, I want you to change me. Change me. I want to give you everything. I want to give you my attitudes. I want to give you my appearance. I want to give you my attractions. I don't want to go to the bars anymore. I don't want to do any of that anymore. I don't want to look that way anymore. I want to give you everything. I believe there's some people in here that ain't giving God everything. Hadn't given God everything. The temple of the Holy Ghost, it ain't never been a church building. It's not a church building. We can't walk in church and be right with God and look one way and leave and look a complete different way. We're not right with God if we do that. We're not right with God. Brother Ted, you go ahead and come. I'm done. Let's stand. Let's stand. Thank God for the Word of God. And Father, as we get a song ready of invitation, I pray if you spoke to somebody's heart. Lord God, that you might lead them by the Spirit of God, Lord, to have a change made in their life. Lord, I believe that we as God's people need to use this altar just as much as those that are lost in their sin. Lord, a place of dedication. Lord, of consecration for the Lord Jesus. God, during these few moments, Lord, of self-examination, help us to be honest with God and come and bow. And God, give you the glory and praise, Lord, for the body that you have given us to live in that we might serve you. Well, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing. God has spoke to somebody's what heart. You can wash away my sin and think but the blood of Jesus. for that. Amen. Appreciate Brother Jackson. Let's pray for him that God might bless him and use him Amen. in the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Eddie's going to sing another song right now. Eddie, I want you to come and sing another song and just a few minutes here we'll have another preacher, another young preacher. Thank God for the message we've heard and you pray for the remainder of the service. Amen. Stepped out of nowhere, the world in his hands, and hung it on nothing but his command, and spoke into me all these things that we see. But in his own image, he made you. There's no loss of strength, and his mind's never left him unable to think. His nerves are shattered.
His hair isn't gray, but he still works his wonders in mysterious ways. And God is still on his throne. He will take care of his own. He sends thousands and thousands in thousands of angels. He will take care of his own. He sends thousands and thousands in thousands of angels. We're never alone. For God is still He sends thousands and thousands in thousands. Angels were never alone, for God is still on His throne. Amen. We're going to do one more song, Lola, with the congregation, but I'm, I'm thankful that God is still on the throne. I'm thankful even in, the, in, the, even in this day and hour that we're living in today where we're seeing moral decay, like Brother Jackson preached about in our churches, in our homes. It really started in the home, really. That's where it started. And then it got into the churches, and now it's all over the country and all over the world. But I'm thankful that God is still in control of this thing, and He is going to take care of the saved, born-again child of God. And I tell you what, we need the power back in our churches. That's what's missing not only the moral decay in people's lives, but we just, the church just doesn't have any power anymore. It used to, used to be that when revivals and camp meetings happened in churches, that the beer joints would shut down, people would get saved. And that's what we're missing. We're missing the power of God. We've got to have it in order to please the Lord. I'm going to tell you this, I'm going to tell you this story. And uh, our uncle... Uh, my great uncle Willard Reed. He 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 owned the beer joint in Inglewood for over thirty years, brother Donnie. And when he got saved, he was he was listening to Dad on the radio, and he got convicted of his sin of unbelief, and he got saved. And when he got saved, he went back to that beer joint, brother Jeff, and he destroyed all of the alcohol that he had in that beer joint. This was his livelihood. This is what he did for over 30 years. And because he got convicted of his sin and got saved and born again, he went and destroyed all of that and he started witnessing to those moonshiners and those people that he'd gotten that alcohol from. And the rest of his life, he served the Lord because God changed his life. I have a problem with people who say they got saved and they never darkened the door of the house of God. There's never a change that's taken place in their life. Thank you, Jackson, for that message. And blessing our heart. We need, that's what we're missing. We're missing the change in people's lives. But God is still in control. One day he's coming back for the church, and I believe it's soon and very soon. What a day that will be when his face I see. Amen. Let's all sing this old song together. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. Last 
curse. There'll be no sorrow there. No more burdens to bear. No more sickness, no pain. No more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. Sing it. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. here. Let's sing it together. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day. What a day, glorious day, that will be. He's worthy of all of our praise. Amen. 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 Yes. Amen. Aren't you glad for that brighter and better day on up ahead for God's children? I assure you this, according to the Bible, it is going to get brighter and better on up ahead. Just as the darkness comes into this tent, the lights get brighter and brighter. And the Bible says the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Amen. Thank God. Just hang on to the promises of the Lord and everything's going to be all right. Appreciate the message we've heard. Looking forward to the message that we're going to hear. Thank God for Brother Aaron Roberts. We've had him in our church, and we thank God for the gospel that he preaches. We listen to him on the radio. Does a good job. We're going to pray for him, aren't we? God might bless him. All right, come on, preach the gospel. Just turn it on here. I sure do count this a great honor and privilege to be here tonight. Amen. These great dear men of God and all the different churches here it is a great honor that we can come together and serve christ and worship him in spirit and in truth just like we're going to do just like we sung about one day coming a day we're all going to be together worshiping jesus christ and you know i thank god for brother jackson back there the stand you take brother i want to thank you for that phenomenal job you did and i thank god for his precious word and there's one thing god's not changed his mind on and that's his word it's still the same just as he's not changed his word's not changed there's been a lot of translations, a lot of different things. People have changed the Word of God, but one thing that has not changed is the infinite, is the spoken Word of God. Amen. And there's one thing tonight that I want to bring out that God reminded me of. It's one thing that God has not changed His mind on. And that's the sinful nature of human mankind. The sinful nature of human beings. God has not changed His mind about sin. And I believe we live in a world today that we believe that God is not going to judge us for sin. We believe that it's all hunky-dory with God. We can do whatever we want to as long as we go to church, as long as we live a good life, and as long as we're saved, we can do whatever we want to. If you have your Bibles tonight, very familiar verse of Scripture. I know we've all heard it probably from the time when we were very little growing up in church. One of the things we learned in Romans chapter number 6, in verse number 23, we pray that God will anoint His precious Word as we stand and read it. We'll take one verse here. And it says, For the wages of sin is death. I want you to get that. We all know that we earn a wage, and a wage is something that we are paid for, but when we earn something, we work for it. And it says here, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. And let us pray. Our dear kind, gracious, heavenly Father, Lord God, we come before you as humble as we know how, Lord. Father, Lord God, we know that we're nothing, Lord God, and we stand here, Lord God, in the midst of these people, Lord God. We know, Father, that we were once lost and undone and dead in our sins, Lord, and yet you came by us, Lord. You had mercy on us and you showed us the grace and showed us the truth. God, you showed us the life, Lord God, that we can have through Jesus Christ. And God, you gave us the greatest gift of all. You gave us your knowledge, Son, Jesus, Lord, that died on the cross and you made us, Lord God, the sacrifice, Lord God, to satisfy your wrath, Lord God. And I pray that we may have a way to come to you, God, that we can be saved and have life in this world, Lord God, and we can be a light to the darkness, Lord, and we can walk, Lord God, in spirit and in truth. Lord God, we can walk up straight and be holy, for thou art holy, Lord God. We pray that you bless tonight, Lord. Lord, Father, they be one here lost. Lord God, you can meet their heart. Lord God, be one here has a need, Lord. Father, you speak to them, Lord God. You just remind us, Lord God, of that you've not changed, Lord God. You've not changed your mind on us, Lord. And Father, we just give you all the honor and glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want us to see here as we see in Romans chapter number 6 and verse number 23. Paul here was talking to the Romans. And if you're not familiar with the Romans, that's the people who crucified Christ. You know, and Paul talked to them and this is the day and age after Christ had already died and rose again. He's sitting on the right hand of the Father at the time that this was written. And we see here Paul was telling the Romans, he said, for the wages of sin is death. And I got to reading that. I'd actually got this from somewhere else in the Bible. God led me to this verse here. He said, Aaron, I want you to look at something. There's a lot of wages that people are out there earning today. There's a lot of wages that people are earning. There's a lot of wages that the churches are earning today. And there's going to be a day that we're going to have to pay. We're going to get a paycheck for the wages that we've earned. And sin. There's going to be a payday. Yet we have the hope and the relief that we can satisfy our sins in Jesus Christ that we can come to Him. You know, He is our advocate, yes. But that's not something we can use lightly. That's not something that gives us a license to sin if we're saved. But I find an even greater problem. I see an even greater problem is the sin that in the whales. Jackson he hit on the outward appearance, the outward things yeah. of the body. And he, and he said, yes, that the inward part has to be right first. But I see it, God reminded me that the inward part is a constant battle, is a constant struggle and a constant fight. Whether you've been saved for 20 years or just for two minutes, it's a constant struggle. I praise the Lord for the soul that was saved at our church last night. But I know that pretty soon if she doesn't get in the Word of God, if she doesn't learn who Christ is and learn what God's done for her, the devil will have her back out there in the world and he'll tear her down and he'll destroy her. We see that the wages of sin brings some things to us. I got to looking at the definitions of sin in the Bible in the Old and New Testament. The Greek and Hebrew definitions of the Bible. And the first thing that I came to is to miss the mark. And I'm not going to go with the Greek words and things, but this is just the, the terms we can understand. Sin also means crooked or perverse spirit. There's a lot of crookedness in the world today. There's a lot of crookedness in our churches today. There's a lot of perverseness in the church and in the people. I've never seen the lack of perverseness in the spirits of people that just don't care what they do. And then we see that it is violence. Oh, in the day and age we live, what kind of violent people we are. Oh, the violence that runs our, our news, our, our newspaper, the telecast, everything, the violence. And then we see a lack of fellowship with God. Oh, one of the things that sin breaks the most. It distorts your fellowship with God. And it keeps you from having fellowship with God. And if you're lost, it keeps you from having a relationship with God. See, when you're lost, you have no relationship with God. For sin, the indwelling sin inside of you, the wages you're working for is enmity against God, which means you can't please God. You can't come to God. He's got to come to you first. But when He does, that's when you accept Him or reject Him. Now, if we accepted Him and we're saved, then we have a relationship. If you've been ever accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and allowed Him to take over your life, you don't have a relationship with God. You can be brought up in church from the time you're in diapers and they carry you and feed you until the day they carry you to the graveside. That doesn't mean that you have a relationship with God. But yet we see here that our fellowship can be broken with God. And it comes with sin. 
And then we see sin is evil and wickedness. Yes, yes. We also see that sin is a trespass against. Yes, right. Trespasses Amen. against God. Amen. Which means to cross the line. I wonder and I ask myself, I ask myself this, I ask God, I said, oh God, please let me see that I've not ever crossed the line. Or well, a question we should ask ourselves, have we ever crossed the line with God? The lost souls that are out there, how many of them have crossed the line with God and there's no hope for them? They've allowed sin to take over their life and they've been the servant of sin so long that they've crossed the line with God. We see here it also is lust and uncleanness. As Jackson hit that as well, the church of Corinth. What a day and time we live. Is he hit on the thing of pornography? Yes. Did you know that pornography is one of the most selling things in all the United States? The, all of the United States, they sell more of that. They make more money on the porn industry than they do in anything else. Oh, how sad that is. Lust and uncleanness, impurity. And as Brother Jackson said, he brought out, Christians face that. There's a survey that ministers face that. Church people face that. Christians are facing that each and every day. And then there's one of the greatest things that broke my heart when God showed me this. The definition of unbelief. One of the greatest sins you can ever commit. Listen to me. One of the greatest sins you can ever commit. And I'll be sure, and I, I guarantee tonight is where I stand here, and I guarantee you on the authority of God's Word that the sin of unbelief will absolutely destroy you. And I warn you tonight, I hope I sound out the warning tonight, that I do what God asked me to do, that the sin of unbelief, the devil will make sure it destroys your life. That it destroys your life. There's four things I want to look at real quickly that the sin that sin does to our bodies. Whether we be lost or saved, it affects us all the same way because sin is on the inside. It's the human nature. It's an indwelling thing. It's an act of rebellion against God. We do a quick history lesson right quick. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, rebellion against God, they broke God's commandment. The one and only commandment. They rebelled against God. They disobeyed God. So sin set in in their life. They became... Separated from God and the fellowship of God. They became separated. Then other things, rebellion, anger, malice, jealousy, all these things come in. Not long after that, there are only two sons. There are only two sons, Cain and Abel. The anger, the jealousy, the hatred, the violence. Cain slew his brother Abel from the results of sin for what was inside his heart. What was inside his heart. We see as we go on, as we go to Abraham, and we see that the, the nations as they were, the people that they were fighting and conquering each other, and they, they didn't they, they hated each other. We see that sin, the rebellious acts of sin, as they tried to build the Tower of Babel. They all gathered together. We're going to build a temple to God. We're going to get to God. And God separated it. The indwelling of sin. We see we come through that. Come through the Bible some more. We see the days of Noah. Oh, the days of Noah. And I think about as Christ talked in Matthew and in Mark and Luke and John the Gospels about the last days to be as the days of Noah. What sin done to the days of Noah. And how he had to destroy the very creation he created because sin had become so rampant, it became so great that he couldn't stand to look upon it anymore. And then that reminds me of the story of Lot, a just man, a saved man, a Christian man, locked in, in the sin nature, locked in the, in the sinful city of Sodom and Gomorrah. He couldn't get out. He couldn't find his way out. Abraham, couldn't pr- Abraham had to pray him out. Had to pray him out, and God destroyed the city. God destroyed the city. But there's some things that sin done to all those great things, and the greatest thing that sin has ever done is we look through all the greats, you know, that have fallen by sin, David and Solomon. We see them, we see Samson, all the greats of the Bible that sin has destroyed their lives, has, t- has done something to them. But we see the greatest thing of sin is it took Jesus Christ to the cross. The greatest thing that sin has ever done is it took my Jesus and your Jesus. It took Him to the cross of Calvary. If it hadn't been for sin, Jesus Christ would have never had to came. But it breaks my heart to think that because I couldn't live right, Jesus Christ had to die for me. Because I couldn't justify myself in the sight of God. Christ had to die for me. That sin, my sin and your sins, it put Him on the cross. It put Him on the cross. 
If we look over in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, as we see here, sin, the first thing that sin will do to you, whether you've been lost or saved, the first thing that sin does is it will dull the senses. It will dull your senses. And you know what your senses are, your sense of taste, your sense of smell, your hearing, your seeing, your, ta- your feeling, the, the, the sense of touch. Sin will dull all that. It will dull those senses and it will bring sin in you. See, it comes from the inside. And so I can remember when I first got saved, the convicting power, it was on me. I started to read the Bible and things that I knew I didn't know was wrong. I began to see were wrong that I was doing and God convicted me of them. And He started to change my life in it. And the things that I thought there wasn't no big deal about, God said, that's not right. He said, it may not be wrong in itself, but it doesn't do anything for me. And we see that it begins to dull our senses. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, in verse number 3, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. But this is what I want to look at. It says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. My friend, if you're here lost tonight, the devil's number one job is to blind you. The devil's number one job is to put you in darkness. The devil's number one job is to make sure your senses are dull. So when the Spirit of God does come by your way, you can't see Him, you can't feel Him, you can't touch out, you can't reach out and grab Him, and you can't taste Him. The Bible tells me, taste and see that the Lord is gracious. But if your senses are dull, you can't see Him. Your vision gets blurry. Your hearing gets impaired. You don't taste like you once did. Your sniffer's not as good. You can't smell out that sin in your own life. You start sniffing around like an old dog, like a hound dog. Say, where's this sin at in my life? Where's it at? Let's get it out. It stinks. There's something not right here. But we see here, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, that is the eternal gift that God gave, Jesus Christ, that is the light. It says, who is the image of God should shine unto them. And get what Paul said here, for we preach not ourselves. This ain't about Aaron Roberts. This ain't about Jackson Smith. It's not about Old Fashioned Baptist Church or Open Door, any of the churches represented here. But it's about Jesus Christ. That's who it's about. And if you came here to listen to me, you came for the wrong reason. If you came here to support the church, you came for the wrong reason. The reason you should come here is to support and give glory and honor to Jesus Christ. Because He's the one that saved you. And if you're not saved, He's the one that can save you. I thank God for Jesus Christ. I thank Him that we have a way that when sin dulls our senses, that we can be brought back to reality. And that is when the devil tries to blind us. You ever been blindsided by things at work or in your life? You just wonder what in the world, where did this come from? Where did this come from? Sometimes it's the devil, sometimes it's ourself. You know, sin not always means that the devil's around. Sin's you. Just as Jackson preached the temple of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is you. But guess what? The temple of the world is also you. The carnal temple is you. An infinite, a struggle, a battle, a spiritual battle. How serious it is today. Another thing that sin does is it deadens the body. As it will deaden the spiritual body, it will also deaden the physical body. As we look over in Psalms, Chapter number 39, in verse number 11, David said, When thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity. Now God only corrects man if they're saved. Now he will reveal unto you your sins and iniquities if you're lost. But see here, he says, When thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty, his beauty, (laughs) your good looks, your bad looks, your appearance, makes his beauty to consume away like a moth. Yeah. And that word consume means to melt away. Have you ever grabbed a hold of a moth before and it's got that powdery substance on it? And it gets on your fingers or gets on where it's at, but once you do that, it, it, it doesn't look good. It, it can't function right. right. It starts to die. Yeah. Yes. And it says here, like a moth, surely every man is vanity. Selah. Every man is a vapor. Let me tell you this tonight. If you stand before a holy God, you stand as a vapor. You stand as vanity before Him. 
Unless he sees the gift that he's gave, if you've never accepted that gift, the only thing he sees is your sinful life. And the only thing he sees is the wrath that his son had to pay for you and you didn't accept him. It's a sad, sad thing to picture. A holy God, a just God that loves you so much, that loves us so much, that would give us a way out, but we wouldn't take it. Because of sin, it would deaden the body. Christ said it best in Matthew chapter number 15. He gave the definition of sin over Matthew chapter number 5, though he had already gave the disciples a little bit of a lesson on this about the sin of the indwelling. He said that anger was the same as murder and lust was the same as adultery. As we can see here, the inward emotions and the inward things of people constituted the outward actions. As Brother Jackson preached, and I know I keep going back to him, but the outward appearance, the outward actions of people tells you all about what's inside. When you're alone and nobody's around, that's when you really see who you are. That's when God really knows who you are. Anybody can put on a show for anybody out town. You can put on a show for somebody in church. You can put on a show for somebody at Walmart or at the movie theater. Anywhere you go, you can put on a show. You can dress up real nice and know, well, these people are going to be here, so i got to act like this. But when you're alone, by yourself, that's when God knows. That's when God knows. But we see in Matthew chapter number 15, as we read right quick here, in verses number 18 through 20, that Christ said, or in 17, Do you not understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out in the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. First thing sin will do is it'll dull your senses. It'll dull your mouth. You won't realize what you're saying. And what you're saying won't bring conviction to you of what it might be wrong. But he says, and they defile the man, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defile not a man. God said it's not about your hands, your outward side. It says what's inside is, is what defiles you. And sin will deaden the spiritual man. There'll be times I've seen people, and I've even noticed it in my own life since God, in a very, very short time, God showed this to me that when things not, we may not consider them sin or may not consider them wrong. But they begin to, you know, one time it hurts really bad, it convicts us a lot. The next time it doesn't bother us so much. The next time after that it doesn't bother us so much. And then after that we don't even really, we kind of we kind of like doing it. It doesn't bother us at all. And then we just say, when are we going to get the chance to do that? And I'm not pinpointing anything because that could be anything in your life. If it doesn't glorify God, it doesn't bring God glory and honor, and doesn't do anything for Him, and what's it do? It uplifts you and uplifts somebody else. It'll deaden the spiritual body. It'll decay you like a cancer. And it eats you from the inside out. See, many of us will be eat up and we don't even know it. I hear it all the time. I work in the medical field and there's people that come in with cancer. Well, it's only been there, you know, just a few weeks or just a few months. But it's a lot worse than I ever thought it'd be. A lot worse. And I've, seen, I've had people die. You know, in six months, four months, three months, we try to give them the best treatment we can, but they never make it. They don't make it too late for them. They don't make it. And I think about the heart, their soul, the most. You know, I think about what have they done with their life? What have they done for God? Were they saved? Were they lost? Did they serve Christ? Or did they serve this body and serve the flesh? Were they a servant of sin in bondage? And we see one thing that sin does. And I'm getting to the most crucial ones here. Is sin distracts from the truth. Sin will distract you from the truth. We see in Proverbs chapter number 16 that sin will distract you from the truth. And uh, Solomon said it in verse number 2. He says, all the ways, not just some, but all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. But the Lord weigheth the spirits. All the ways. All the ways are clean. All the ways are clean. In our own eyes. If our senses are already dulled and we're half dead, it wouldn't take much for sin to distract us from what the real thing is. What the truth really is. Now I find the truth is God's Word. I find the truth is the Holy Spirit of God. I find the truth, the real things of God are in His Word, are of Him. Everything's real. Nothing's fake. Nothing's false. Nothing at all. 
And you know, there's a saying, I guess you could say there's a lot of people like that today that, well, I didn't tell a lie, I just didn't tell the whole truth. I didn't tell a lie, I just didn't tell the whole truth. Or we might exaggerate a little bit and say, well, it wasn't this that happened, but this kind of happened and I'll just leave that part out. That part's not important. And if you're honest with yourself, we've all been guilty of it. We've all been guilty of it. That's what sin does. It distracts you from the truth. When the truth is going on, when the Word of God's being preached or somebody hands you a track or God asks you to do something, He's asking you to do it in the truth and in His name. There's many people out there that's false. The Bible tells us false teachers, false preachers, people that's out there teaching different doctrines that's not true. It's blatantly false and it goes against what God says in the Word of God. But yet they're claiming, people, they're claiming that it's God's Word. They're claiming that it comes from God. And the th- bad thing is that people are, the droves are coming to them and just, just soaking it up. They're soaking it up. And all the while in little churches and little places like this, the truth is being preached. But they have no, there is nowhere in sight because they're distracted. They're distracted by the truth, by sin from the truth. They're distracted. And then we see here in verse number 25, if all the ways of a man are clean, then he's going to pick one path in his life. The decision comes, the ultimate decision comes, I believe, once in everybody's life, whether to accept Christ or not to accept Him. If you've ever heard the gospel preached, if you've ever heard the name of Jesus, I believe the Holy Spirit can take that and He can convict your heart. And He can, he can teach you and He can show you things and give you enough faith to believe in that name to be saved. And I believe there comes a point in time in everybody's life when they come to the age of accountability that they make a decision. They take one path or the other. And we see in verse 25 it says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. He said not only all the ways of man are clean. He says they're clean. But he says then there's a way that seems right. There's a way that seems righteous to him. A way that seems like, well, this is the right path. I'm going to blaze this trail. And it's not governed by God. It's not led of God. It's not convicted by God. But it's like a puppet. The devil just stringing them along. Follow me this way. Follow me this way. Follow the breadcrumbs. Follow the breadcrumbs. Follow the sin. Follow the good times. All the great things that's happening in your life. Follow that. It feels good. You like doing it. Now, while the truth, there's there's flags coming up. There's signs coming up. The truth is is is, is all around. But yet they're distracted from. It. They can't see it because they've been blinded. Their senses have been dulled. Their body's been dead. They don't know what life is. And they're distracted from the truth. They're distracted from the truth. And then we see finally the ultimate penalty for sin. We see in Romans chapter 6, number 23, it says, For the wages of sin. And I work just like many of you do. And at the end of two weeks, I get a paycheck. If I don't show to work, I don't get paid. I got to work for that paycheck. That I earned my wage by working for my boss. The Bible tells me you cannot serve two masters. Well, there's, there's two masters in this world to choose from. I'm trying to make it as simple as I can because I know there's youth here. You can serve God and Jesus Christ or you can serve the world and the devil. But they both have a paycheck. They both have a paycheck to give you. And it says the wages of sin is not punishment. The wages of sin is not a whipping. The wages of sin is, you know, not detention or time out. But the wages of sin is death. The ultimate price you pay with your life. Your paycheck is your life. Just think of, think of it that way. Everything you're working for in this life is going to count on you. Your life is going to be your paycheck. Where do you spend eternity at? The one thing sin does is it destroys the soul. Sin destroys the soul. It defiles the man from the inside. It dulls our senses. See, the senses are outside. The senses are everything that's outside. And then it works inward and outward, back and forth, and just consumes you. And it deadens the body. And then it distracts you from what you need to see. It distracts you from the truth, what you need to hear, or what you need to taste of, or what you need to get a hold of. And then it will destroy your soul. 
Also in Romans chapter number 6, we see that Paul has told the Romans in verses number 12, he said, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. You know what I see there? He was telling him, he said, let, let it not reign. Someone that reigns over you has authority over you. Someone that reigns over you has authority. He said, in your mortal body. He said, not just your spiritual body, but your mortal body. He said, everything about you, don't let sin reign over you. He says, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. When something reigns over you and they have authority over you, you can't help but obey it. You can't help but obey it. If the president was to come down here and tell us something and we broke the law, we couldn't help but obey what we had to do. A sinner, a person under the authority of the devil and the, the, the demons that Satan has to offer, they can't help but obey it. They can't see the truth. They can't, they can't feel the Holy Spirit tugging at them, convicting them. And it's destroying their soul. We see here as it says... Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. And I know he was talking to the Christians, telling us, he says, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Then he says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now get this, he said, what then? What does that mean? He says, shall we sin... Because we are under the law, but under grace. Not under the law, but under grace. God forbid. Which tells me that our everyday actions should be not to sin against God. You say, Aaron, that's completely impossible. You're right. But if you're saved, your your life is hid in Christ. That's right. You have faith. You have hope. You have an advocate with Jesus, with God. Jesus Christ. But if you're lost, you don't have that. Guess what? You're earning some wages. You're earning some wages. They're going to lead to a paycheck of death. It's going to lead to the destruction of your soul. But yet it's going to seem right. It's going to seem clean. Because that's what the devil wants it to look like. That's what the devil wants it to look like. Then we see in verse 16 it says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey. I want you to get this. Christian, know ye not. That to whom you yield yourselves servants to. Who you yield to. That's right. Who you present yourself to. Amen. Who you give in to. Yes. His servants. Yeah. Ye are to whom you obey. Yeah. Get this. Whether of sin unto death. If you serve sin, it's a service unto death. Right. The end result is death. You're going to die. Amen. You're going to die in your sins. Yeah. And without the love of God in your life, without Jesus Christ, you'll suffer a death that will never end. You'll suffer a death that will be in hell. You'll lift up your eyes just as the rich man did and just as every person has ever died before. And after Christ, if you've never accepted Him, you'll die a death that will never die. You will die. Get that? You will die an everlasting death and it will never end. It will be an absolute nightmare your worst fear, death, that will never end. It will destroy your soul. It will destroy your soul. And last we see over in John chapter number 3, as Jesus Christ gave the greatest verses we know and we see in verse 16, but I don't want to look at verse 16. I want us to look at verse number 18 and 19. It says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The greatest sin I could find is the sin of unbelief. And the devil wants you to not believe. That's what he wants. That his sole purpose, his sole job is to distract you from the truth. Once he's got your senses dull, listen to me young people. In school, you see people doing things and you say, well, I don't want to do that. I go to church. I'm not like them. But if you start hanging out with them, you get to do what they want to do. And then it might bother you for a little bit and you'll kind of back away, but then they ask you, invite you to do something else. You go with them. It doesn't bother you as bad. It doesn't get to you as bad. And the preacher preaches on it. It doesn't bother you. Then you start to hang out with them and it doesn't bother you at all. You just say, hey, Mom, Dad, I'm going to go with them, knowing that they're up to mischief. They're up to no good. I don't really like that with, our, with the adults, though, in our walk of life. We know things are going on that's not right, but yet we'll kind of just ease on over there to it. 
and we should be turning around and running. Or we should be rebuking them and telling them the truth. We should be telling them the truth. But yet we'll just kind of let it go on behind. We'll turn our backs and just let it happen. Then when once it's done, we'll we'll go back to everything being normal. Sin will destroy our soul. The sin of unbelief. And it says, And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Jesus Christ said, Hey, I didn't have to convince them to do evil. I didn't have to convince them to believe in the light. I didn't have to convince them that the darkness was okay. Because in all this, once you're distracted from the truth, your bodies begin to die. Spiritually, you're dead. Your physical body begins to die and your senses are dulled. You might as well just live in darkness anyway. But we see here, in verse number 20, he says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But we see here, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. And you say, Well, Aaron, you've preached on nothing but sin. I want you to realize that that sin is real. That it is real in your life. It's not a game, but it's something serious to take into consideration. That sin separates you from God. And sin will destroy your life before you know it. It'll take your soul to hell. And guess what? The devil won't come and visit you in hell. He won't come and see you in hell. He won't come and say, hey, look what you done. I didn't everything. Wasn't it fun? Wasn't it worthwhile? He's not going to say a thing. He'll be nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. And yet we see in Romans, for the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We see that God has made a way. You say, what's the plus side of this? Jesus Christ came and died on a cross. Jesus Christ paid the penalty for sin. You don't have to live in darkness. You don't have to walk in darkness. You can have life. You can have Jesus. You can have hope and joy and peace. You can have the Word of God. You can have assurance. And you can be aware of godly and spiritual things. And you can be aware of the sinful things in your life. And serve the living God. And please Him. Which, oh, that's what I want to do is please Him. Yet so many times I find myself in the sins of my own self setting me back. Setting me back. But if I ever allow it to take over my life, it will destroy my soul. The Bible says that over in Paul's writings, many times it says that those that were turned over to reprobates, those that were destroyed by fire, that the soul might be saved. Those having a conscience seared with a hot iron. Those that turned, they once professed Christ. They once professed they believed in Christ and lived for Christ, but yet now they've separated themselves from Him. They've apostatized. They've denied everything that they ever had. We're living in a day and time that way. Yes, where sin, sin is acceptable. Yeah. People dying is acceptable. People right. living a sinful life is acceptable. Right. And people living a Christian walk of life, that's things of old. Yeah. Yeah. I believe it's time. Yes. I believe it's time to recognize sin for what it really yes. is. Amen. I believe it's time Amen. not stop t- to stop taking a back seat to sin and letting it rule in people's lives. Because it's going to distract them from the truth. Amen. You say, well, Aaron, what about... They don't, they don't ever read the Bible. I know. We're supposed to be that Bible. We're supposed to be that light. If you've ever walked in the darkness, if you've ever been out in the darkness and you just see the moon, it's, it's bright. Just yeah. the moon by itself. Yeah. It lets light shine out. Yeah. If you've ever been a really, really dark night and the moon's covered with clouds and there's no stars out, but all you need is just a little bit of light. From a light, from a candle, from a lighter, or from an itty bitty small flashlight. That's all it takes. That's all it takes to shed the darkness away. I tell you, in closing tonight, Jesus Christ is that light. You might be living in darkness and the servant of sin, but I tell you tonight, all it takes is Jesus Christ. That's all it takes. You got to come through Jesus one way or another. You're going to come to the cross in your life. You're going to come to Jesus Christ. And you're either going to accept Him or you're going to reject Him. You're going to accept His life that He gave for you and accept the gift that God has gave or you're going to live in your sin and you're going to let it destroy you. I'll turn it over to Brother Ted as they come and get a song.
Let's stand. Thank God for the message. There's a scripture in Hebrews, one verse. The gospel was preached unto us as well as unto them. But the gospel did not profit them, not being made, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. We have a responsibility for what we've heard tonight. To mix our faith and say, God said it, I believe it. Now, it's settled whether or not we believe it or not, but we are to believe what God has said through His men and through His creature. Somebody here tonight, you need to get closer, you ought to come get closer. You're lost, you ought to get saved. You're living in darkness, you ought to come to the light. Thank God for these young men that are preached. But if somebody is here and you need to come, you come while we sing. Amen. Kneel at the cross. Christ will meet you there. Come while he waits for you. Wonderful job preaching the Word of God. And, uh, the tent revival will continue tomorrow night. Brother Glenn Amen. Standridge is going to be the moderator. And Amen. Calvary Baptist Church is responsible for the singing and the musicians tomorrow night. We thank God for our community revival churches coming together and, and just uh, leading this tent revival meeting. And Brother Brad Lane, thank you so much for all the work that you have done here on the tent for uh, putting in the electricity and many, many other things as far as permits are concerned. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love. We appreciate that, Brad. And everybody that has took part in this, we thank God for uh, the Watson Brothers Trio, the PA system that they set up and uh, singing that they did tonight. Sister Lola, we thank God for her and the musicians. We just want you to come back tonight, uh, tomorrow night, and we want you to invite somebody. I pray that we'll have more here tonight than we had tonight. And that will only happen if we're interested in the meeting, not only on our night, but the other nights that we're excited about asking folks to come out to the house of God. Amen. And let me ask you to do this. The ghouls know what's happening here, and I'm talking about the thieves and the robbers. And there'll be stuff here that uh, they just might want to break in and steal. And why don't you drive by and take a look. If you see something out of sorts here, just drive in here and... Find out what's going on. Check this place out. And we, we need uh, some folks to do that. Make it, maybe you work another shift and you can do that. Maybe you get off in the morning and you can come by in the early hours. Why, feel free to come by the tent and to come in here and to make sure that uh, some of these thieves around here hadn't had their way after God's had his way in the tent service. Amen. All right, Brother Roy, does anything else need to be said, brother? He said that there's a picture that needs to be taken of the tent preacher. All right, so the ten preachers before the service Friday night. Uh, why, and two, young preachers back up the revival each night. I mean, tomorrow night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. Back up the other preachers in this tent meeting. It's a community uh, young preachers tent meeting. Amen. And so churches come back. Not only if your preachers preach tonight, back up the other preachers in the tent meeting. Anything else? All right.
Let's be dismissed in prayer. Brother Jeff Roberts, come up here, sir. Amen. And please dismiss us in prayer. I'd be honored. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again, Lord, for being in the midst of us tonight. Father, as we come together to worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord, we just thank you tonight, God. Our Lord, Father, tonight for the men of God as they stood, Lord, and proclaimed from the 1611 tonight, Lord, the King James Version of the Word. I want to thank you, God, for your honoring these men tonight, Lord, and the sweet Holy Spirit that came and dwelled among us tonight, God. I want to thank you for your blessings up on us, Lord, and I pray for the remainder of this week, Lord, that you just bless, Lord, help each and every one that stands, God, to preach your Word, Lord, you to anoint them and help them, God. God. Bless the hearers to hear, God, this week, Father, be one that's lost, God, just save them one. Oh, God, I pray, God, that you just help. Give help, Lord, to the Christians not to stand and be somebody for you, God. Help me to stand and be somebody for you every day, Lord. All I can be for you, God, I love you, and I beg you for this, Lord. Bless, Lord, and help these men, God, each and every one that's assembled here, God. Bless this meeting, the ones that's put it on, the ones that's helped, God. Just bless them and help them, Lord. I love you, Lord. I appreciate you. Thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do.